in from the New Testament. Why? Because when we talk about uh, Francis the first, um, then we of course want to say not only you know what really happens, but also what ought to be, or what could be, or what should be. And we cannot simply do that, you know, because we feel that way or whatever. But we have to have some kind of an objective measure by which we can judge reasonably what could happen or what he should do, or what he should reform, and so on. And um, we can talk about this a little bit later on. We want to start with something like inner criticism. That means we look at each religion, not only Christianity, uh, in terms of its own code. So in terms of its own interpretation of reality and its own um, uh, orientation of action. The, uh, it would not be fair to judge a Muslim by Jewish standards or a Jew by Christian standards or a liberal by Marxist standards or the other way around. If we want to do justice to all of them, including to ourselves, then we have to look at the Catholic in terms of his own standards, and the Protestant in terms of his own standards. And so we want to look at the papacy and this pope uh, in terms of the code of Christianity itself, and the, the, the Gospels. So we don't tell him to uh, become a liberal, we don't tell him to become a Marxist, um, but we could tell him and ourselves to reform the Curia, or the Om, uh, or the Vatican in terms of the Gospels. So, therefore, we want to uh, set the measure by which we think and by which we make our judgments in terms of the Gospels. And so the first reading today, as you can see there, is Matthew 16, 20 to 22, to 16 to 22. And this is a little bit small. I don't know if I can read this really, but I will try. I even have a magnifying glass. That's what you need when you get over 100 or so. <laughs> so okay, so the story is here. Um, the first one is the rich young man, in which um, Jesus tells us something about wealth. Uh, we had this starting point there. The Pope um, attacked the on Christmas, a highly commercialized Christmas. Suddenly he attacked the idolatry of money and so on. So he has good sense for timing. He times things well. So. But uh, what about, it's not the pri a private opinion of the Pope, uh, it is not only Catholicism, as we know, it's one, it's the third paradigm of Christianity, but it is the foundation of Christianity itself, that means the Gospels. And here we have a story, the rich young man, uh, and there was a man who came to him and asked, Master, what good deed must I do to possess eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is one alone who is good. Now this is a sobering thing, particularly when there is too much uh, um, elevation of Jesus. Um, he says, don't call me good. There is only one um, who is good, and that is the Father in heaven. Don't call anybody Father. You have only one Father in heaven. Don't call anybody teacher, you have only one teacher in heaven. So Jesus makes clear the difference between himself and the Father. If we want to talk as believers in terms of uh, Jesus the Son of Man or the Son of God or so, it is good to start with the human side, to, with the rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth. And then we can see to what extent uh, uh, his friends or he himself or so went uh, beyond himself. Uh, because he never called himself Messiah, he never called himself uh, the Son of God, he only called himself the Son of Man. But that comes from Daniel, and I discussed that recently with the rabbi, the rabbi said, well, he just meant that he was out of flesh and blood. I said, well, he meant a little bit more, because that, uh, that Son of Man in David, in, in, uh, in the prophet there, is, uh, uh, is uh, not simply so human as one may think. So, nevertheless. There is only one alone who is good. We should take that very seriously. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. That's the Ten Commandments. That belongs to the measure of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. He said, which? 
These, Jesus replied, you must not kill, you must not commit adultery. He repeats the Sermon on the Mount, right? That's the first and the second commandment of the Sermon on the Mount. And you must not steal. That's not in the Sermon on the Mount. You must not bring false witness. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. That means that's the third commandment, uh, not to take any oath or so. And we said already the president takes an oath, we go to court, we take oath, and we do that on the Bible which forbids it. Honor your father and mother, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. The real translation is you must love your neighbor because he is you. So that is something, we all have something in us where we say, I'm not the other, I'm not the other. And that has something to do very often with our negativity or the negativity of whole states to say, we are not Russia, we are not Germany, we are not Persia, not Syria, or whatever. So that overrules, overrules that, it negates this negation. Love your neighbor because he is you. And then it goes on, the young man said to him, I have kept all these. Well, how he could have got, become rich without stealing is quite a question. <laughs> but Jesus was not an economist, nor did Aristotle or Plato know where wealth came from. So on that we have to forgive them. I have kept all these. What more do I need to do? Jesus said, if you wish to be perfect, go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. They have come, then come, follow me. But when the young man heard these words, he went away sad, for he was a man of great wealth. So here we have, we could say, that the presupposition of the kingdom of God is communism. And the patron saint of this church here, St. Thomas More, still said this in the Utopia, the great book he wrote, the Utopia. That means we have to go through communism before we enter the kingdom of God. And it goes on a little bit, the story there, dangers of witches. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you solemnly, it will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes, I tell you again, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle that was a little door in the wall of Jerusalem where the lovers were crawling through at night when the big doors were closed. So a camel, even if you put it on a diet, it could not go through. So to pass through the eye of a needle, then for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were astonished. Who can be saved then, they said. Jesus gazed at them. For men, he told them, this is impossible. For God, everything is possible. That is the Torah belief that God can do everything. Okay, so we have a little thing which we can say we know already also what the kingdom of God is like. It is without poverty. It is also without marriage. Since people don't die anymore, marriage is not necessary anymore. Um, it is without class. So um, we, Jesus speaks in images, the kingdom takes images from, from nature. Somehow for Jesus, all of nature turns into, into poetry and images, so it is similar to a little seed, which is growing slowly, innumerable par parables and so on. So we have to piece it together. He does not make it positively clear. Maybe sometimes the book of Revelation in chapter 22 or so, there, there are a little bit more concrete things, but they are also all negative. No sadness, no tears, no death, no stealing, no murder, no uh, uh, um, lying, and, and so on. So, and there is something important in this negativity, because otherwise people could say, well, we have it already, or so. That means the kingdom could be co-opted, and it has been. There were times when people thought the church was the kingdom of God. That was a great mistake. People do die in the church, people do lie in the church, and so on, and so on, and so on. So people participate in crusades, they murdered in the church. So therefore the, the church and the kingdom are not the same. He could even say that Jesus came to bring the kingdom and all what came was the church. But that's all we have. So the church is the place, the community, in which people keep awake their hope and their longing for the kingdom. That is the sense of our cognitive operations, our dogmas, our <coughs> morality principles, and of our 
um, expressive side, namely our liturgy, our songs, and so on, they should keep awake in us who are not in the kingdom. This world is not redeemed, not even close to it, but, in, but that the hope is kept alive in this unredeemed world that redemption will come, that there will be a retroactive, retroactive type of, uh, as the great uh, scholar Benjamin said, retroactive uh, redemption of, um, of the victims of the past, of the slaves of the past, of the served of the past, of the workers of the past who had to die without having had their day in court. Think of the one million who have been killed in Iraq just in recent years and so on. Um, they are now uh, laying in their shallow graves while <coughs> Bush celebrates in his, uh, in his library. So <coughs> that uh, retroactive um, redemption means that history is not closed. History is closed, they are dead, but that history is also open, that a retroactive redemption is possible that the Messiah can connect the past with the future. That is Jewish thinking, and that is also Christian thinking, and that's also Islamic thinking. Okay, that was our first reading, and uh, that should be the foundation on which we have our uh, discussion. So, uh, it is not simply a matter of opinion or whatever what the Pope should do, but um, whatever he should do has to be measured by the Gospels. So um, he forbid recently that people call themselves Monsignor, uh, down our Monsignor Martin, my good friend, he cannot call himself M Monsignor anymore, but he calls himself Father, and that's as bad, because Jesus said, don't call anybody Father, you have one Father in heaven, and particularly that Holy Father. So if the Pope tells the Monsignors not to call themselves Monsignors, he has to stop people to call him Holy Father. But that will be very hard, not because of the Pope, but because of the psychology of the believers who want to be children and want to have fathers on whom they can be t depend. Sister says, father says, and so on. That is good for some time, but people have to grow up. They have to get beyond their fathers, and it is very hard. <clears throat> so, therefore, the Pope may hold on to that a little bit longer until people have matured a little bit further. Okay. Now, in our first discourse, we talked about Father Baron, you remember, a traditionalist and director of a seminary around here, and Immanuel Kant, the great enlightener, and that means we talked about faith and enlightenment, and we saw that Father Baron was much, very much opposed for, to Immanuel Kant, that he makes him responsible for this article here, uh, in, in here, where, which stresses particularly the ethical side of Christianity, that means to take care of the poor and so on, but forgets the cognitive side, the dogmas, and forgets the, um, forgets the, the liturgical side. That means he does not blame the Pope, Baron, but he blames that newspaper having misunderstood the Pope, and therefore created a different uh, false picture, and also false hopes and, and uh, expectations among the believers and non-believers. Um, and therefore says then, but the Pope also says, and they say in the article that he prays all the time, <coughs> as a matter of fact, he, he prays also when he goes to the dentist, I think everybody prays when he goes to the dentist, so that's quite understandable. So, <coughs> nevertheless, that was one of uh, our points there. Uh, we tried to explain what idolatry is, we went to the uh, second and the third commandment, not to make images of the absolute, not to name the absolute, all images and names are defective. So that is, by the way, which Moses and Kant have in common. The Kant, uh, Kant is the modern enlightener who forbids people to enter the realm with analytical understanding uh, into the realm of the thing in itself, which means God, freedom, and in, in, uh, um, eternal life. Uh, if we do that, we get into antinomies, we get into contradictions, and we talk nonsense and so on. So, Therefore, science has to restrain itself, has to see its boundaries. It cannot talk about infinite things. They are open for faith. Well, Kant was a believing Lutheran, besides being an enlightener. So here we have the two things together. Unfortunately, Father Bern is a traditionalist who wants to have this antagonism between faith and, uh, and uh, enlightenment. But what would be much more preferable would be an enlightened believer rather than an unenlightened one. 
the um, uh, past uh, uh, Benedict. Um, he wanted particularly to be taken care of the naive believers, and naive not in a bad sense, but the simple believers who don't see any contradictions and so on. And that's fine. That's, that should be done. But the, the hope is that people will become more and more educated because the less they are, the more they will be isolated. They will be excluded from the public sphere. We just published a book here, Dustin and all of us, we do that together, about the world religions in the public sphere. So we can talk about Christianity you know, in the private sphere, in the family and so on. But if the um, Christianity still wants to be relevant in the public sphere, so that it is translated into the state and so on, so like homosexuality and all that, then we have to learn to, um, to become enlightened because we have to translate the Christian message to those who are secular and who are modern and who know that something is missing. But that's all they know, that something is missing. They don't know exactly what is missing. So, therefore, those who translate the religious message, if it's Islamic or Christian, they have to do an important job. So, uh, one could simply say, we don't do that. We stay among ourselves and uh, to hell with the others who are secular. So, but um, that is a decision which, which we will see what the Pope will decide about this. So, we explained a little bit about money then and what it is, the universal commodity, and it stands for all commodities as such really harmless, and the question is uh, why Jesus thought it was so bad. And, uh, but we have to explain that a little bit later. We have a reading there by Luke 16, the right use of money. We'll see that Jesus thought money was bad, but that you should do good things with the bad money. Uh, so you could redeem it somehow by applying it well. Okay, so then we talked about liberalism, that it was originally a Protestant thing, that it's very atomistic, very individualistic. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. What is wrong is what's missing, and that is solidarity. But uh, we can say we are a liberal country without solidarity, but we have to be careful. I drove into the snow recently and got stuck, and five of my neighbors suddenly came out of their houses and pulled me out. That's solidarity. I think we all, as Americans, have it in ourselves, this solidarity. And, but it comes only out when the system breaks down. But if the system comes up again, we are individualistic again. I had that also in Canada. I drove once with all these forests, they are unending there. And then I got right into a ditch into the snow. And then I stood there with my wisdom. But then came all kinds of little people came out of the bushes there and pulled, lifted, I had a catalog, a miserable old catalog, lifted it up and put it on the street. And then they disappeared without saying one word. That's solidarity. You don't have to talk. But it's beautiful. It's uh, unbelievably human and humane. So, therefore, this uh, is there with us too. But it is only there when the system doesn't function. When the system functions, we all go back into our own, own houses and then <laughs> Solidarity becomes a little bit weaker. Then uh, we saw the movie, Enemies of War. Why did we show this movie? Well, it comes from Latin America. The Pope comes from Latin America, but not only that. Latin America is our colony, to, together with Indonesia. So, therefore, we have all kinds of dictators there who keep order there so that the cheap labor and cheap resources can be appropriated there. And so, where the Pope lived, there was a dictator like this, and he um, did not, was not uh, Romero. So, um, we don't want to say, we show the movie so that we know what he did. He was not martyrized. He was not martyrized because he didn't do what Romero did, and he didn't do what uh, the five Jesuits did, who were murdered, and what the five four nuns did, and the one lay woman did and they were murdered and so on. So, therefore, there is a suspicion, you know, that he does not stand up. There were two priests who blamed him that he did not stand up for them when he was Archbishop, um, that he was not a Romero for them, but he reconciled himself with them. He celebrated the Mass with one of them in Frankfurt and uh, they became friends again. But the other one died without forgiving, but if there's something to be forgiven, that means something went wrong. So, but in everybody's life, something can be wrong. That doesn't mean that in the future it will be that way. So the, we will see, we have to be 
very open and very friendly and very loving and so on. <laughs> so then um, the enemies of war and we remember the five Jesuits and who were, by the way, all five of them solidarists. A Jesuit, like the Pope, has to have a theological study of six years and then he studies something else, economics and so on. These Jesuits were murdered, had studied economics, so they knew exactly how a fascist system works and how many sacks of coffee they is in and how much they get, the workers get, and how much you pay here for the same coffee and where the profit is made on the way and so on. So they could uh, uh, somehow study it in detail and that's why they were killed because on that basis they made the demand that the workers should get more out of their own work. Uh, that means the Jesuits were solidarists. Solidarists? Solidarists were mixed up by the fascist government, by the Arena Party, uh, with the communists. So the communists want to do away um, with the private appropriation of collective labor. So capitalism is the private appropriation of collective labor. Socialism is the collective appropriation of collective labor. That means those people who produce the surplus value also appropriate it. And uh, not those who do not produce the surplus value appropriate it. So, so um, I had once a class in the economic department there. And um, so one of uh, the students who was even related to me, so my son, um, he stood up and he said, Professor Siebert, the only way why, why we are coming here, the only reason why we are coming here is to get rich and to make money. And you are so critical all the time. So I said, well, do you have a dollar in your pocket? Take it out. So he had a dollar. And I said, well, if you have worked for this dollar, then you can be happy and you can put it back. If your father gave you that as a gift, you can also be happy. But if you have this and you have not worked for it, and it should have any value whatsoever, somebody has worked for it and didn't get it. I want to make $100,000. I have to feed my mother. By the way, I control him all the time. Every year I ask if he still feeds his mother. He does. He does. <laughs> He's very good. So he doesn't make entirely $100,000 yet, but he still feeds his mother. So he's a good fellow. So. <clears throat> but nevertheless, so this uh, is sometimes not entirely clear what, you know, where something is wrong with us or whatever. So we have to be as precise as possible. So <clears throat> nevertheless, the, um, we, uh, the, the Pope was in this situation. He was not martyrized. He survived it um, while Romero died and the four nuns died and the uh, Jesuits died and 7,000 basic Christian communities, people were murdered, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, including their liberation theologians, who were people who were influenced by socialism, but without being socialists. So what is the difference between solidarism and socialism? Once more, um, the solidarist does not want to uh, expropriate the capitalist by taxation or anything, or by killing him or so. They say private property is okay. Uh, so you can have the private property of the means of production as well. But you have to pay fair living wages so that the children of your workers don't have weak brains because their diet is terrible and so on and so on. So that's it. But if you make this demand and you tell the workers to organize in order to get their wage up, it does bring the profit down. It brings the surplus value down. So in the case of the communists, the surplus value goes all to the workers. But in the case of the Jesuits, the surplus value goes a little bit more to the workers. That is quite a difference. But that difference is not seen very often in the heat of the class struggle. And so Romeo was killed because he and his priests were communists, in spite of the fact that this was not true. They simply didn't see or didn't want to see the difference between a solidarist from solidarity and a socialist or a communist, and they are different in themselves again. <laughs> so, uh, and the, the murders were committed by terrorists, were trained in Fort Benning, um, our school of the Americas, or the so-called school of the assassins. The priest bourgeois, or Marinol, leads every year, and we can see a movie about that too, uh, leads people to Fort Benning and they protest against the school of the Americas and want to have it closed. That's going on for a long time. The priest bourgeois fought in Vietnam and he was in the Navy 
um, and he could not live with himself after what he had seen and done, so he joined an order. Uh, that happened also to one who threw the bomb on Hiroshima, as you know. So um, the um, people who bombed Hiroshima, Tibbets is still alive as far as I know, but uh, one of them killed himself. Another one made propaganda so that this murder thing would never happen again. He was put into an Air Force insane asylum and died a few years ago from cancer. And one of them joined the Trappists, and I visited him in the Blue Ridge Mountains in the 50s. Um, the Trappists cannot talk, but when they have friends coming in, then they can talk for a little while. So, but they had no other solution for what they had done than to choose that way. And so the priest Bourgeois joined the Marinol people, and for many summers I went there and I, I told you and, and gave courses there to the missionaries, to the nuns and, and the priests, <coughs> to the nuns in order to prepare them to talk with socialists, because they have no socialists here, they don't know how to talk with them. And then we found out also on the way back that when they were supposed to stay with their family for, for vacations, four or five weeks, they left already after two days because they could not talk with their mother and father anymore about what they had experienced. They didn't believe them. They said, this is not possible. We are not doing this. This country is not doing this. And so, so, so we had to, you know, tell them what they should do in both of these situations. <coughs> so that, uh, nevertheless, the uh, priest, uh, Bourgeois uh, was put by Ratzinger, by the, by the uh, German Panzer Pope, they call him sometimes. Uh, nevertheless, poor man, uh, Benedict XVI, he, um, under him, 90 people, great theologians, were all uh, thrown out of the church or out of their office, and many times without uh, any sustenance any longer or whatever, pension, everything lost, and so on. So, uh, and he, Prince Bolivar, was one of them. He was also eliminated. Another one was Fox in Chicago, who then went to the Episcopalian Church and so on. So, and the Pope speaks about wounds. These 90 are horrible wounds which uh, the, the past two Popes have, uh, have produced. And so this priest bourgeois, he was also <coughs> thrown out, um, but not because of his protest against the school of the assassins, but because he stood up for women priests. That means the um, sisters there in Marinol, when I was with them, they sometimes celebrated the Mass without being ordained. They were quite um, dynamic persons there. Uh, that is, of course, by canon law, that's called a Missa Sika, that means a dry Mass. That is what all the priests who became Protestant ministers then um, in the Reformation time, they all celebrated a, a tri-mass, and that is true also for the Anglicans today, from the Roman point of view. They all celebrate invalid masses and so on. But the uh, sisters were very eager to, uh, <coughs> to enter the priesthood and so on. So and he defended them, and that was the reason why he was thrown out of his office and his priesthood. Okay, so the day we want, first of all, is there anything else which you would like to ask or we want to have it very open, you can, you know, break in wherever you want to. And whenever I say impossible things, if you can write, jump on it. And if you feel any uh, emotional dissonances or cognitive ones, please be open. In the church you cannot talk, but here we can talk. In the church women should not talk, here everybody should talk. So, <laughs> Yeah, unusual. <laughs> Is there anything what you, you know, what comes up that you just come whenever you want to? Okay. So um, uh, the um, what we want to do, we want to start out this time and the next time with a time diagnosis. What is the time diagnosis? You have a certain event like the Olympics, for instance, in Russia now or so, and then you diagnose, you analyze this event. And then you also add a prognosis to it. What will become of that? Is there something developing out of it? And that's what we want to do. And uh, the first thing is the Pope wrote a letter. I think Dustin gave it to me. Dustin, mm -hmm. you did. Yeah, thank you. Um, he wrote a letter to the, um, uh, to the World Economic Forum, which was missing, which is meeting, which has been meeting. It may be finished now, maybe last week or so. Davos Closters, 
It's a kloster. It's, it's in Switzerland. It's a, and kloster is a monastery. So <laughs> it's a strange place. What are these economic people there? So in Davos kloster's in Switzerland, they met, and the Pope wrote a letter to them to this World Economic Forum, in which the richest countries of the world have met. Uh, for a week or so, and I just want to take a few things out uh, uh, because that is our contemporary issue, and then we can analyze this a little bit. Um, I'm very grateful for your kind invitation to address the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. That is very nice of the Pope. There are the people, he just cursed the uh, idolatry of money. There are all the money people, but he does not curse them, but he starts out very nicely. That is the captatio benevolentia. You, when you talk to an audience, you say something nice first so that they like you. Otherwise, they hate you and they don't listen anymore. So um, he imitated Paul, St. Paul, as you know. He was in Athens <coughs> and he came into the city and there were all these idols, idolatry, all these beautiful gods and goddesses. And they were not standing in the temples, but they were outside of the temples, so he could see them all. And, um, of course, for a Jew, for whom faith comes through hearing, through the ear, to that faith comes through the eyes, was unusual, and he thought that was all against the second and the third commandment, the horrible images of the absolute, which are all false, and so on. And then he goes to the Aya Park, and there, the meeting place in Athens, the political place, and there were the, uh, the Stoics and the Epicureans, and there he addresses them, and he says, You good men, you are oisebioi, you are such faithful, beautiful people, and so on. And I have seen the beauty of your gods, and so on. That is a captatio benevolentia. It's not exactly lying, but it's a Jesuit trick, in a certain sense. So that's how you get people on your side. If he said, You idolatrist, you'll go to hell, nobody would have listened to them. By the way, they didn't listen to him anyway. When he came up later on and talked about the resurrection, they thought he would introduce a new God. And uh, when they understood that the body should be resurrected, they thought this is impossible. Our whole life long, we want to get rid of that damned body, and now he tells us we will have it also in the other world. That was too much for them. So they said, well, Paul, we'll see you another time. They called him a little parrot. He probably had a Greek accent, had a <coughs> Hebrew accent in Greek. So um, he spoke all three languages, but probably with a little accent. So they thought he was a little pad and padding around there. And uh, so he made <coughs> only two converts, I think, on that day, more than this. And by the way, 400 years later, the University of Athens was closed by force by a Christian emperor, and no professor had converted. The reason for that is that the New Testament, what I just read to you, is written in Koine Greek. That means in proletarian Greek. So the, um, the prophet spoke in a good Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever, but, um, but the Christians were from the lowest class and their Greek was not entirely good. So one reason why these people didn't accept the Gospels was that they were written in that miserable Greek. It's almost that if you take the English from the north side there and write a book in it, so then that would be the same, it would be an equivalent. So, so therefore, that was one thing, and then the whole thing of the resurrection or so, that was not acceptable for them. So, nevertheless, the Pope speaks very nicely to them, to these idolatrists there who met in this place there. And uh, so he says, trusting that the meeting will provide an occasion for deeper reflection on the causes of the economic crisis affecting the world these past years. So he means, what does he mean? 2008. Right, the financial disaster, which was a result of Reaganomics of uh, Reagan. That means to stop Keynesianism and shift over to the uh, Chicago School of Deregulation, which brought about the, this disaster, which continues, by the way. Uh, the Fed has just withdrawn a little support. That means the whole system is still on life support. They have withdrawn a little bit, and the stock market right away went down a little bit or so. so they have to be very careful because the crisis is far from over. So, nevertheless, that's what the Pope means. I could like to offer some consideration in the hope that they might enrich the discussions of the forum and make a useful contribution to its important work. So this is Jesuitism. It's very friendly and uh, nice so that, that they will listen to him. Ours is a time of notable changes and significant progress. There is another Captatio Benevolentia 
the, the, the progress which was made, so the capitalists made progress uh, in different areas which have important consequences for the life of humanity. In fact, we must praise the steps being taken to improve people's welfare in areas such as health, care, education, and communication. That is a quotation from Evangelii Gaudium. That is the encyclical letter which was written by the predecessor. So, so they, they praised it also too. So here is our health care, uh, the single payer thing, by the way, Mrs. Clinton, uh, may run on single payer things. That means the real thing, we don't even have the real uh, health insurance, it hasn't even started yet. So uh, she may take that into her platform to go one step further, which Obama wanted to do, whichever reasonable person would do, but he gave that up because he thought he couldn't get it through and so on. So uh, Mrs. Clinton will start out with what Obama gave up and then we will have a real one of which they are in, in the Wall Street and not prepared for it yet, I think. In addition to many other areas of human activity, and we must recognize the fundamental role the modern business activity has had in bringing about these changes. Now, if the Pope is naive or uh, plays naive, that's another question. He said he was a little bit naive, and Wall Street said that his economics was a little bit naive and wrong even. So. We have to see, you know, he is probably doesn't have an economics degree or whatever, but we have to see how, and then he hasn't written that neither, so somebody else wrote it for him and then he signed it. So we have to see what is behind all this. As had in bringing about these changes by stimulating and developing the immense resources of human intelligence, nonetheless the successes which have been achieved, even if they have reduced poverty for a great number of people, that if, uh, appeals to that the, the, the situation which we had under Marx and here in the slums of uh, New York and Boston and so on, that improvement has taken place. So you don't have the tenement houses anymore, you have the projects instead. So they are not flat, they go up into the sky, but they are still the tenement house in another form. But um, what the popes have said and, and wanted to recognize is that capitalism has improved in certain things in the core countries, which have capitalistic core countries, which met there in Davos. So there is some reality behind it. For a great number of people often have led to a widespread social... Ex no, so now, here it comes. Now he turns around. Now it becomes honest. Nonetheless, the successes which have been achieved, even if they have reduced poverty for a great number of people, often have led to a widespread social exclusion. So politics of exclusion, politics of inclusion is an important uh, concept which, which is introduced here. Indeed, the majority of the men and women of our time still continue to experience daily insecurity, often with dramatic consequences. So after the Captatio Benevolentia, you are great people, you uh, businessmen, etc. Well. Then he turns around now and can get to his issue. In the context of your meeting, I wish to emphasize the importance that the various political and economic sectors have in promoting an inclusive approach, that is his approach, inclusive approach, which takes into consideration the dignity of every human person, that's, that is the um, uh, solidarism uh, uh, which the Pope represents, and the common good. So you have here three concepts which are very important. Uh, one concept is inclusiveness, the other one is the common good, and the other one is the dignity of every human person. No person should be made into a means for purposes of production or whatever. Every person is a self-purpose, which by the way the, uh, they have learned that uh, from Immanuel Kant. I'm referring to a concern that ought to shape every political and economic decision but which at times seems to be little more than an afterthought now. The little Jesuit gets more and more critical and puts the knife into their heart. <laughs> Those working in these sectors have a precise responsibility towards others, particularly those who are most frail, weak, and vulnerable. It is intolerable. See, the language becomes sharper and sharper. He has this captatio benevolentia from the beginning and he feeds on it now that thousands of people continue to die every day from hunger. Eight people die every day in Florida, we heard tonight. That's contemporary issues. 
because Florida has rejected the federal government's uh, support of health insurance and so on. So because they don't have any health insurance, the illness is not found early enough, it's not taken care early enough, so eight people are dying a day because Florida rejected Obamacare. It is intolerable that thousands of people continue to die every day from hunger, even though substantial quantities of food are available and often simply wasted. So we had just an agricultural bill that's just gone through. Uh, it could go through only by cutting millions of food stamp people. That was the deal which, uh, which the president made with the right. And uh, it includes also that uh, certain things are not produced. You know that for decades already uh, we uh, do not produce certain things because that would bring the price down of pigs or whatever. And therefore, we cut it during the Great Depression and the times we put milk into the streets and so on and so on. The reason for that is when you have oversupply, then uh, of course the, uh, the price goes down. And uh, if you want to keep it profitable, you either have to destroy it or you have to plan for it that you will not produce it in the first place. So then you will, it's mainly agriculture, it's not the little farmers who are dying a million a year, but it is big agriculture corporations and so um, they one, one of these things is that they don't overproduce. <laughs> um, likewise we cannot but be moved by the many refugees seeking minimally dignified living conditions. The uh, president doesn't get the immigration law through neither so it's, uh, he has, Pope obviously has us in his mind here. Uh, many dignified living conditions who not only fail to find hospitality that is one thing, and it's very important. Uh, Jesus, Jesus thought that the men of Sodom were destroyed by Yahweh because of a lack of hospitality. In the story, in the first story, uh, it says it doesn't say homosexuality, but it shows the men want to sleep with those two men who had come into town. So it looks very much like homosexuality. Isaiah said that Sodom was destroyed because of the injustice of the women in Sodom who did not share their wealth with the poor. That is why God destroyed them. Jesus is the most harmless one. They were destroyed because they were not hospitable. The people came to town from the desert, they were supposed to take care of them, and they wanted to sleep with them. That was not a good thing. By the way, Jesus is very, very um, friendly in a certain sense. He says, the men of Cyrus will have it, the men of Sodom, the men of Sodom, will have it better on Judgment Day than the men of Sidon who have refused to, to, uh, to convert and to um, somehow to, to repent, to repent, yeah. And uh, so Jesus assumes that people in Sodom had still time of to repent or that they really repent, but if you repent then something must have been wrong. So um, Jesus saw that was something was wrong, but for him the most important thing was not that there may be homosexuals, but the main thing that they were so unhospitable, uh, were not, uh, didn't show hospitality to the strangers coming into town. And by the way, all that can help, you know, in the culture wars, when we uh, want to fight those culture wars. I think those alternatives of interpretation um, in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament and in the Holy Quran uh, may be very important. So who not only fail to find hospitality, but often tragically perish in moving from place to place. I know that these words are forceful. Now he reflects on himself. First he is friendly, then he gets tough, and now he reflects, well, maybe I wasn't a bit too tough. That is all Jesuitism. Even dramatic, but they seek both to affirm and to challenge the ability of this assembly to make a difference. In fact, those who have demonstrated their aptitude for being innovative and for improving the lives of many people by their uh, um, ingenuity, see, it becomes a little friendly now again, he almost falls back into the Baptizia Benevolentia, ingenuity and professional expertise can further contribute by putting their skills at the service of those who are still living in dire poverty. And now comes something interesting here, the last thing. What is needed then? is a renewed, profound, and broadened sense of responsibility on the part of all. Business is, in fact, a vocation 
and noble vocation, it's a noble vocation, provided that those engaged in it see themselves challenged by a greater meaning in life. That is again Evangelii Gaudium, uh, page 203.